Hey everybody, John Lorden here. Happy Friday. Can't believe it's June 1st, 2018 already. Welcome to another episode of Brain Scratch. Um, today's case is going to be a little different. This is actually one that some of you are going to probably think, hey, isn't this a searchlight case? And at, towards the end, we might kind of kick around, hey, isn't this a case cracked? I wish it was. It isn't quite there. Um, there's some very strange things going on with this case right now. We're talking about the case of initially it was missing five-year-old Lucas Hernandez. Unfortunately, his remains have been recovered. So we know that this is definitely in brain scratch territory. Now it's a question of trying to figure out what happened to Lucas. And let's go ahead and start with an image here of a very adorable looking five-year-old. Um, definitely a heartbreaking case. This is one that uh, people have been letting me know about over the past several months on Twitter. I've done a couple of retweets about this case. Um, I was considering getting it covered on Searchlight, but once I started looking into the elements of the case, I, I got a very strong indication of where it was going, and I was pretty sure at some point that it was going to wind up here on Brain Scratch. So I kind of held off, and here we are uh, discussing the case now. A lot of strange things happening around this case. We have a uh, stepmother that seems extremely suspicious in this. Uh, we've got some interesting things with the father that quite honestly, I'm not seeing a lot of people really address or discuss. Uh, and we have a potential history here of abuse that Lucas might have been going through and why, even though people were trying to raise the flag around that, why didn't any help come? Uh, why didn't anyone come to his aid? Uh, I don't know, and I don't know that we'll get a very good answer to that question. But uh, as usual, let's start from the beginning of this story with a Facebook post at KWCH12 Eyewitness News from February 17th of this year, 2018. Have you seen him? The Wichita Police Department is searching for five-year-old Lucas Hernandez, who was last seen near Edgemore between Lincoln and Kellogg. Anyone with information should contact police immediately in all capital letters. And of course, once again, they have this adorable picture of Lucas. Um, just to give you guys an aerial view of what they're talking about, um, here is Edgemore Street, and we can see Lincoln is down here and Kellogg is up here. So. Uh, in this area is where it was reported that he went missing initially. Uh, jumping over to kwch.com once again, uh, this, there's a lot of local coverage on this, but it's from a few sources. So uh, I just want to thank them for really staying on top of this case. And this case already has hit kind of national exposure level, but outside of that, on web sleuths, I don't think I've seen a case with as many threads as this one has, particularly in this short of a period of time. So uh, Lucas has really captured the hearts of a lot of us out here, and we definitely want to see justice come to this, this young boy. Search continues for missing Wichita boy. Um, police have been searching for any signs of five-year-old Lucas Hernandez. In the air, on horseback, and on ATVs, officers spent much of the day searching Wichita parks for Hernandez. The search expanded since the boy was first reported missing Saturday. Uh, police say members of the community have offered to help, but the department has all the resources it needs. Police say the best thing for people to do is to share any information they can to help find Lucas Hernandez. And let me just give a big thank you to the brain scratchers that were letting me know about this and everyone that was really kicking this up on social media. There was a very strong presence uh, about this story on social media, and you guys are a big part of that, and I really appreciate that you're out there doing that. Family members say Lucas lives in a home with his father, stepmother, and another child. They have concerns about what's been going on inside the house. Monday, Eyewitness News spoke over the phone with Lucas's great aunt, Sally Rasmussen in New Mexico. She says she and other family members think Lucas was being abused. She says Lucas told his great grandmother he was being hit and kicked. That's when Rasmussen says she reported the potential abuse to the Department for Children and Families in Kansas. She says she made this report last spring. 
and she has not seen Lucas since then. Um, I have not been able to find any information on any follow-up that happened here, uh, at least that's been publicized. So if you run into that type of information, please add it in the comments below so we can all check it out. Um, I'd like to think that there was at least some type of caseworker assigned or maybe someone at least stopped by to kind of check out the house and talk to the family a little bit. But unfortunately, we just don't have those details here. Kristen Edson says her cousin, Lucas Hernandez's stepmom and father, anxiously wait news of the five-year-old. I think they mean await for news of the five-year-old. Um, very distraught, very upset, devastated. I mean, can you imagine? They're just very distraught and worried about his safety. It's cold out. We don't know where he's at, said Kristen. And keep in mind, this is going on in uh, February at this time in Kansas. And from what I could see on Web Sleuths, people were talking about it getting um, pretty close to th between 30 and 40 degrees. So uh, when you consider that there is a little boy out there, a five-year-old, no shoes, no jacket, that's a pretty serious situation. Another quote from Kristen, all I know is that they took a nap around three-ish and she woke up with the baby around six to check on Lucas to see if he was in his room. She searched, the back door was open, and she called 911. They're talking about the uh, stepmother in this case. And I, I guess that they have a younger baby around one year old. Uh, that's also part of this. So that's the baby that we're hearing about in this quote. He does have a speech impediment. So it's kind of hard to understand what he's saying when he talks sometimes. He's very shy if he doesn't know you. If he does know you, he's willing to come out and to talk to you. From other information I've reviewed, it seems like he has a cleft palate uh, and his family's saying that, yeah, it's kind of difficult to understand him, but if you really listen, you can, you can pretty easily determine what he's saying. He has never wandered off like this before ever. So, I mean, it just worries me that maybe somebody got him to open the door for them and possibly took him. Wichita police say the FBI is assisting in the investigation of the disappearance of five-year-old Lucas Hernandez. Officers and canine units have diligently checked the home and neighborhood with no luck of locating Lucas at this time, says Officer Charlie Davidson. Um, so already on the outset, very worrying case. Um, no one wants to hear that your, your five-year-old is missing when you wake up. But of course, are we getting the straight story on all that? Let's continue. So February 21st, only a matter of days after Lucas disappears, the stepmother of missing five-year-old Kansas boy Lucas Hernandez was arrested on Wednesday afternoon on child endangerment charges. Uh, her name is Emily Glass. And this article doesn't go into it too much, but essentially, um, I think when they were questioning her about Lucas's disappearance, she gave them some information about what she had done the day before. And that included her smoking some marijuana and then taking the one-year-old for a drive to Olive Garden to have dinner together um, while she was high. So that is where the child endangerment charges come from. It's another interesting question to think, uh, where was Lucas during all that? Did they just leave a five-year-old at home alone? Uh, certainly adds to the mystery once we continue into this story in terms of trying to understand everything. February 28th, while sitting in jail on a child endangerment charge, she opened to a local Wichita reporter about Lucas's disappearance publicly for the first time. Glass previously told police she took a shower and then a nap at around 3 p.m. on the day in question. She said when she woke up, the back door of the family home in Wichita was open and Lucas was nowhere in sight. When asked if she hurt Lucas in any way, she denied it and said she would never harm him and has no idea where he is. And here we have a quote from her. I did not. I would never hurt my son. He's like a son, you know. I may not have given birth to him, but he's my baby boy. I take care of him every day, you know. March 7th, the founder of Texas EquiSearch said that the search for Lucas is eerily similar to the search his team carried out in 2008 while searching for Kaylee Anthony. Quote, this feels way too familiar. And unfortunately, I think there's one person who knows and they just aren't saying anything. 
So everyone's working as hard as they can, Texas EquiSearch founder Tim Miller told KWCH 12. After we went to Kaylee's funeral, I said, I never want to do one of these cases again. And right now, it appears as though we are here. So you can see very early on, we're talking within a matter of a few weeks, professionals are starting to to chime up here and say, look, we think something is really wrong here. And it seems like that something might have happened in the home. Um, I'll tell you guys, since I've started doing uh, this show and Searchlight in particular and looking into cases like this, whenever I hear the situation of a very young person disappearing from their home, I immediately, my flags just go up right away because I've looked into too many of these cases where it turns out to be that the initial story we're told isn't true and that some family member is responsible for that person uh, disappearing or being harmed in some way. It's not always, obviously it's not a hundred percent thing. Um, and it's, I don't even know if you could see it reflected in the, in the stories that I actually cover. Uh, you guys probably realize there's a lot more than I look into than actually makes it here on the channel. It's just a trend that I'm seeing, uh, in particular with these stories. We do have different instances. I remember a case uh, last year where a young boy wandered off and wound up uh, in a pond that froze over, unfortunately. So there are exceptions to it. But for a lot of the cases that I look at when we hear this kind of, I don't know, we just woke up and the kid was missing and the back door was open, um, my, my warning flags just raise right at that point. So uh, we get to March 16th and some interesting information comes out. The father of Lucas Hernandez plans to hire a private investigator. And not only that, who's he planning on hiring? Well, he sets up an an online fund to raise money in order to hire client investigations. Now, it doesn't happen. And I don't have a formal reason why. Um, people on Web Sleuths are basically saying that Klein was looking for a certain amount of money that was a lot bigger than a private investigator that actually took the case needed to work this case. And we're going to talk much more about the second private investigator uh, soon. But pretty early uh, on in this case, we do hear that the father is actually looking for some help in terms of getting a private investigator on. And from what I understand from some coverage that Nancy Grace has done, but I haven't found solid info to back it up, the father was actually not uh, at home at the time. I believe he might travel for work and he was not around uh, on the day of this disappearance. So what happens with the, uh, the, the charge that Emily initially faces in terms of child endangerment? Well, we can see here at kake.com, Emily Glass found not guilty of child endangerment. And on this video clip, they actually showed a timeline that they were talking about. I just wanted to run it by you guys real quick. Um, She's saying at 9 a.m., woke up, made breakfast, changed diapers, dressed, cleaned, made lunch, and I think hang out uh, sometime approximately 3 to 3.30, smoked cannabis, um, got Mia and self ready. I believe Mia is the baby. And then approximately 4.30 to 5, traveled to Olive Garden. And they're saying from 5 or 4.53 to 5.43, uh, phone pings, which I believe they're saying uh, is showing that she was actually at the Olive Garden location at that time. So this, I think, was the main um, crux of the case, I guess you could say, in terms of the child endangerment. However, it obviously was not enough. Let's see if we can get some more details as to why. Um, The stepmother of a five-year-old boy who's been missing for three months has been found not guilty of child endangerment in an unrelated case involving her young daughter. Um, I just want to stop there and say that they keep saying unrelated case when they're talking about this charge and another charge that we're going to, to talk about soon. And yes, I understand that it might not be immediately related, but especially now that we're considering that something bad might have happened in this home, and this supposedly happened the day before this young man went missing, this little boy went missing. Um, I don't know that we can say that these things are necessarily unrelated. The charges, yes, are obviously unrelated, but it seems to me that there is a very good chance this could actually be the day that something happened to Lucas. And is that an explanation of why 
only Emily and Mia are going alone to dinner uh, on this day, possibly. Is that a, a reason why Emily might have decided to um, smoke marijuana on, on that day to maybe deal with the stress of what she could have possibly done to Lucas? Uh, I think we really have to consider that. But obviously, from a legal perspective and formally, uh, this is an unrelated case. Glass has been jailed on a $50,000 bond for one count of child endangerment. She lost custody of her one-year-old daughter in April. The girl remains in the care of the state. Now, I haven't seen any updates on that. I don't know if that is still the case. Um, I'd like to hope so, particularly with where we're going to wind up in this episode. Uh, but this was an article just from a few weeks ago. So as of when this article was posted... Mia apparently is in the care of the state. Glass remains a person of interest in the Lucas Hernandez case. The case was at risk of being thrown out because Glass's attorney argued there was not any specific evidence from testing to prove Glass was under the influence. I don't understand how this happened. Um, I'm pretty sure that, you know, if they would have done some type of hair follicle test or blood test or something along those lines that they could have detected it unless they were trying to test it far too late. Um, but even that, I think hair follicle testing, it would still show up. So I'm really curious why there wasn't the physical evidence to back this. Uh, another interesting point here, the defense also argues that neither marijuana nor paraphernalia were found at Glass's house and there were no tangible injuries to the child. Uh, ultimately, the judge decided it was her own admission to smoking pot that kept the case from being thrown out initially. Uh, so really interesting to me. And once again, if we're trying to wrap this up in the context of possibly she had done something really bad that day, does it make sense that she would have gotten rid of her marijuana and her paraphernalia? Um, I've seen some reports saying that she would smoke in the garage. Why would she have removed that stuff unless she was possibly anticipating that police were going to be going through her house when she eventually called in the fact that Lucas was missing? As a matter of fact, this trip to the Olive Garden was this part of, hey, I've got a bunch of stuff that I have to dump, that I have to get rid of, and in some random trash can somewhere is maybe not only this marijuana and this paraphernalia, but maybe things even tied to Lucas's case directly. Uh, really has me scratching my brain on that. Now, when we get to a very interesting twist here, and I'm really not seeing much reported about this, so I wanted to highlight it here. Uh, and it's interesting because on web sleuths, you know, there's a lot of people that are very sympathetic in cases like this. They're trying to associate with the people that are going through these cases. And what's happening here with web sleuths in particular is there's a lot of people wondering why Lucas's father hasn't really been making too many public comments uh, with everything that's been going on with Emily, who, quite honestly, I'm not sure if they're actually officially married or if they are uh, just boyfriend and girlfriend or common law marriage. But um People seem to be adding a lot of empathy towards Lucas's father, Jonathan. Uh, and here we have a really interesting tidbit that once again, officially we're going to call unrelated, but in terms of looking at this as an abusive situation where the abuse could be a chain of abuse, this is pretty interesting to me. The father of Lucas is also heading to court soon. Jonathan Hernandez was arrested for battery in an unrelated case. He's accused of abusing Emily Glass's six-year-old son. His bench trial is set for May 23rd. So apparently Emily has children from a previous relationship. I believe that they primarily stay with their father, but obviously at some point they must have been visiting and something bad happened between Lucas's father and Emily's six-year-old son. Does that have to do in terms of, is it related to what happened to Lucas? I don't know. Is it possible that Emily was upset at what Jonathan had done to her son and there was some type of revenge thing in her head that got triggered by this? I, I don't know. Or is this just a culture of an abusive household and uh, it's just this because everything is like this in this house that this is just something that happened as a result of that being kind of acceptable behavior in this house? I would certainly like to hope not, but when we have charges like this, it's really, really hard to uh, 
to not consider that. So now we get to the private investigator that actually did get hired. His name is David Marshburn, Marshburn uh, and he has been featured on the Nancy Grace podcast for the past couple days. I'll have links to it in the description bo box below so you can check it out. Uh, but there has been a very interesting turn. And in one way, it's kind of good that Emily got off on those child endangerment charges because essentially she gets released and then this private investigator gets to interface with her directly. What happens through that? Let's check out here at uh, ksn.com. Private investigator David Marshburn, 42, said Jonathan Hernandez, Lucas's dad, hired him to find the missing five-year-old. Marshburn of North Carolina said he and his partner arrived in Wichita around midnight on Wednesday. I went and talked with Emily and Jonathan on day one. And then on day two, it was just with Emily, said Marshburn. Marshburn said Emily Glass, Lucas's stepmom, led him to a rural area in Harvey County on the second day. He said it took about five hours on Thursday for he and his partner to locate the body of Lucas. Now, uh, the Nancy Grace podcast goes into this in really good detail. So if you're interested in this case, I really recommend that you check them out. Um, the first podcast, for some reason, the first 15 minutes are edited kind of weird. It's kind of a weird conversation. But what's really interesting about both of the podcasts is how much tape they have. He was recording her while they were driving around looking for Lucas. And uh, I can tell you from listening to all those recordings, it's fairly clear that we're dealing with someone that feels like they did something very bad to Lucas. She doesn't come outright and say what she did. Uh, he does kind of question her at one point about the possibility of Lucas uh, falling or hitting his head, something like that. And she, she kind of agrees a little bit with what he's saying, but I don't think that it's very convincing in terms of using it in court or anything like that. But what is really convincing is she leads them to the body and essentially it is under a bridge um, and the investigator said that when he first saw the top of Lucas's head, he wasn't even positive. He thought it was Lucas's head, but he was expecting dark hair and it looked like the sun had just completely bleached his hair white. Uh, keep in mind, we're talking about um, three months after the fact here. Uh, and this is in an area where water is running through it. Um, and there was, you know, storms in February. Fortunately, that seems to have helped preserve Lucas's body in some way. So uh, he seems pretty hopeful. And of course, I think we all are that the autopsy will actually provide some meaningful, meaningful information in terms of what happened to Lucas. And maybe they can go forward and uh, press charges from there. Over at kake.com, uh, we get some more detail, primarily from the podcast. Uh, private investigator David Marshburn used words like slick and conniving, cold and calloused to describe glass. Uh, he actually was really hung up on the fact that uh, she seemed to be fake crying a lot and that he had bought a whole box of tissues and she wound up only taking one tissue throughout this whole five hour ordeal of them driving around looking for Lucas. Also, something that I think is pretty impressive. Uh, I mean, you heard the time frame in the last article. On day one, he talks to both parents. On day two, they're out and they find Lucas. When he talks about it on the podcast, he's very clear that it, this is solved. Well, at least where is Lucas is solved within about 11 hours of him working from when he shows up. And another thing in the second podcast that is particularly interesting to me is hearing his partner uh, trying to get Emily to talk and to keep her talking and to try to make her comfortable so she'll open up more. Uh, his partner seems to have a really good touch in terms of doing that type of interview. In an hour-long episode of Crime Stories with Nancy Grace, Marshburn opened up. Uh, he said he was hired by Jonathan Hernandez to find his son. After hours of talking to Glass, Marshburn said she led him to the body under a bridge on a dirt road in southeast Harvey County. Uh, he said Glass told him she found Lucas dead in his bed the day she reported him missing. 
but Marsh Byrne doesn't buy that. Now, I couldn't find any information that was very clear about when she says that um, she found Lucas dead in his bed. I don't know if we're still talking about the same time frame, if it was after her nap around 3 p.m. on that Saturday, or if she's now saying that when she woke up in the morning, she found him there. But what we certainly can tell is the story of him being missing and the back door being open are completely fabricated. Um, she's basically admitting that she found him dead and that she took his body to this location. And we could support that she took his body to this location because she was able to take the private investigator back there several months later. Um, here's a quote from Marshburn. I think she resented Lucas because she couldn't have any boys of her own, Marshburn told Nancy. Now, from what I understand, she actually does have boys from that previous relationship. I don't know if he's talking about the fact that she doesn't have full custody of them. Um, so I'm a, I'm a little confused about that statement. Uh, in general, but uh, the biggest bombshell came at the end of the podcast, a recording Marshburn says he took of glass. And let's just play it so you guys can hear it right from uh, her own mouth. A recording Marshburn says he took of glass. I did Lucas so wrong. I did him wrong. I did Lucas so wrong. I did him so wrong. Uh, once again, not quite confession level, but uh, just based on the small clips that we got on the Nancy Grace podcast, uh, I'm sure that this tape in total, if presented as evidence, will be pretty convincing to anyone reviewing this case that uh, she's certainly, certainly up for charges in terms of uh, pro probably impeding the investigation, uh, moving or tampering with a body, which is likely a charge in that state as well. Um, trying to prove that she's responsible for what happened to him, I think is still a little bit in the air uh, because we don't really, at least from the stuff that I've heard, we don't really have a straight up confession that she actually harmed him um, initially. So we, we might uh, we might still be learning some things about that in the coming days, actually. So this all went down just last Thursday, May 24th. Uh, what happened immediately after. This is literally posted the next day at ksn.com. The Sedgwick County Coroner's Office has identified the body of an unknown child discovered Thursday evening in Harvey County as five-year-old Lucas Hernandez. The boy's identity was confirmed through an autopsy and dental records. Lucas's stepmother, 27-year-old Emily Glass, has been arrested and booked into Sedgwick County Jail for felony obstruction of justice. Uh, obviously, I think that's a pretty easy charge to get her on. Uh, they know that she hid his body. Um, now, what happens after this is where things kind of hit brain scratch territory. I really can't explain what's going on uh, with this case after we get to that point, because I think just based on the tape, it would be fairly easy for them to get her convicted on obstructing justice, unless they're having some issue with that tape and thinking it's not going to be admissible. I don't know why they can't make that charge stick and keep her in jail. But for some reason, they let her out. Uh, over at KAKE.com, we see on May 30th, 2018, no charges yet in death of Lucas Hernandez, Emily Glass released. Sedgwick County District Attorney Mark Bennett released a statement, quote, no charges are being filed today while investigators continue to follow up on newly developed leads and await the results of forensic examinations, he said. Lucas's biological mother released a statement following Emily's release. Everyone take a deep breath, step back and chill. There's a reason for this because of what's to come. Lucas will get his justice. Uh, just so you guys know, his biological mother actually lives in a different state. Bennett also said the autopsy report will not be final until toxicology results are complete. Uh, as of when I'm filming this, nothing has been released in terms of the autopsy information. Uh, I'll be interested to see if they do conclude that there was some type of concussion or uh, hit to his head of, of some type, because that seems to be the only thing that comes out in the tape of the investigator talking to her while they're driving around. Uh, or who knows, we might hear something completely different. 
So I'm kind of baffled at this point um, why she's been released. Uh, you know, I mean, if we look at the history of her in particular, the last time she was released, it actually turned out to be a really strong thing for Lucas's case. Are we going to see the same thing here? Are they thinking that she's going to do something uh, where, I don't know, are they following her? I just, I can't imagine what the benefit would be in releasing her at this point. Um, so obviously we have a lot of people that are uh, really concerned about this at I just, I don't know how this happens. Uh, in the court of public opinion, this woman is pretty much already convicted. Admittedly, the real courtroom is going to be a much different situation, but we are, there are no theories that I'm seeing out here about any other potential thing that has happened. Uh, like I mentioned, his father supposedly was away at this time. He wasn't even at the home. So uh, I was originally when I was looking into this, I was thinking, could the father be involved? Maybe did he, you know, is he responsible for harming Lucas? Uh, and then she's responsible for disposing of Lucas or, or some something along those lines. Uh, one interesting thing that did come up in the tape of the investigator talking to her is at one point he asks her if she has discussed any of this with her husband, Jonathan, uh, or her boyfriend, I'm still not sure. Um, and she, the way she answers it, she says, if, if I recall correctly, I think she says, not really, which is kind of a weird answer for that question. Uh, you know, if someone asked me, did I talk to my spouse about something and I didn't, I would certainly just come straight out and say no. Now, if I might have talked to them about it, but I didn't want you to know that, I might say not really. So I was just kind of thrown when I was listening back to that. Uh, is it possible that he has some more information in this case? Maybe. But why would he have hired the private investigator that cracked this thing wide open within a matter of hours then? Well, there might be some information about that too. Also from the Nancy Grace information, uh, the grandmother particularly was a factor in Jonathan hiring this private investigator. I believe the private investigator actually contacted the grandmother and said, hey, look, I know you're trying to raise these funds to hire Klein. Uh, we could do it for a lot cheaper. I've got a great track record. If Jonathan wants this solved, get him to get in contact with me because I know that I could do it. Uh, and through that mechanism is how Jonathan actually wound up uh, at least getting specifically Marsh Byrne to be the private investigator here. So, but we do know that he at least had some previous intent to hire a private investigator because he started the GoFundMe and he was an originally going to go for Philip Klein. So uh, I don't know. I really don't know if there's any aspect to the father being related to this case. Like I said, outside of the possibility of this being a culture within this household that maybe he did particip participate in, in terms of it being an abusive household. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at an article about what some of the family is saying. Eyewitness News spoke with Lucas's great aunt who lives in New Mexico. She says she's upset that Glass was released. Quote, at the time, Emily was sending threatening texts to my mother because she thought she reported her, she says. She was threatening my mother and threats to other family members that they would never see him again. She says she believes Glass killed her nephew. Regardless of whether or not it was an accident, I know that she abused my great nephew, she says. Now we're hearing that she woke up and he was dead. I mean, her story has changed so many times, she says. How can anybody, especially the police, believe anything she said? It's a really, really good question. Uh, in terms of Jonathan, there is a little bit of more information about his case here uh, over at KAKE.com. Wichita police arrested Jonathan Hernandez Wednesday for abusing the six-year-old son of Emily Glass, Lucas's stepmother. A police report showed the crime happened February 5th, less than two weeks before Lucas was reported missing. He was scheduled for a bench trial on May 23rd, but it was continued to July 16th. So obviously, uh, we're still waiting for more updates on what's going to happen with that case. Uh, and are we going to learn more about uh, Jonathan that could possibly make us think differently about his, his involvement as a result of these court proceedings? Uh, I think it's definitely something to keep an eye on. Uh, as I mentioned, I will have a link down below to the Nancy Grace podcast. The ones that you're looking for were published on May 30th, 2018 and May 31st, 2018. Um, they're a little repetitive, but I think that they're definitely worth your time, especially if you want to hear more about how this private investigator uh, worked this case and was able to crack this case so quickly. Uh, I got to say my hat's off to him. Uh, on top of that, um, we will have a link down below to the web sleuths, the first thread 
on this case. So you can start right from the right from the beginning. Uh, if you don't want that, just jump to the last page and then jump to the next thread and you'll have to do that a bunch of different times because I'm sure by the time you guys see this, there's gonna be even more than 26 threads. I don't think I've seen a case on Web Sleuths that has hit this many uh, different thread pages. It's 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 really heartbreaking in one way because we're talking about a five-year-old um, whose life was unfortunately taken from him. But in another way, it's probably the light side or the one beacon of light that I can see in this story is that there are so many people that care about him. There are so many people that were trying to find him when he was missing. And there are people now that are eager for there to be justice in this case in his name. Uh, as a matter of fact, speaking of his name, I thought it would be appropriate to make a donation. So I looked for some organizations that deal specifically with helping children in abusive situations, and I found childhelp.org. I did take a look at them on Charity Navigator. They do have a pretty strong rating there as well, and they do have an area where you can make a donation and actually do it in honor or memory of someone. Just as soon as I'm done filming this, I'm going to do a donation in honor and memory of Lucas Hernandez. Um, and there's another interesting thing about childhelp.org. You can actually direct your donation. So if you wanna make it a local um, donation where you're affecting a, a particular chapter, you can do that. Or if you want it to be national, uh, which is actually a feature I was looking for, I really wanted to try to help on a national level. So we'll be doing it uh, for national here, but. Um, so that's where we're at with this case. Uh, the questions that we're left with now are obviously what happened to Lucas. Uh, the autopsy information is going to be really interesting when that comes out. I don't know. Uh, honestly, I think it could happen as quick as when you guys are seeing this. It might even be released today. So you might want to jump on uh, Google and do a search on uh, Lucas Hernandez and hit the news tab if you want to see if there's any new information on that. Uh, outside of that, once we get the autopsy information, I think we can kind of determine, hopefully, uh, what happened. Are we looking at something that happened to him uh, in the home, outside of the home? Hopefully, it'll give us some information to lead us in that direction. If it is inside the home, then we're, I think we're really looking at this stepmother in a whole different way. Um, outside of that, is there any potential involvement on the father's part? I'm, I'm telling you guys from what I'm hearing, there isn't, but I can't find a lot of really solid information about where the father was during this time frame. So I'm going to leave that as a little bit of an open-ended question, uh, of course. And then I still have the concerns just about the culture of what's going on in this house. Uh, if we've got, you know, uh, a five-year-old that has died in this house and his body was hidden and we have charges against the father for uh, attacking a six-year-old, seems to me that something really bad could be happening in this house. And we have family members that are trying to flag authorities on this. Uh, I just really don't have a good feeling about this. And that's part of the reason why I wanted to make a donation to childhelp.org also. So I hope you'll consider doing the same. I'll have a link to uh, childhelp.org in the description box below. This is where I turn it over to you, Brain Scratchers. Please let me know your thoughts. Of course, as always, I ask we please remain respectful in the comments. Uh, it's about discussing the cases. We can always have different points of view, but let's please try to avoid any you know name calling and just blatantly arguing with other people uh, just to be con contrarian or something like that. Uh, you know, it's it's helpful when the comment threads are really focused on the actual topic. And most of the time you guys do an awesome, awesome job with that. So uh, I just want to keep encouraging you to, to do that as we go forward, because I much prefer that our comment thread look like something that's on Web Sleuth as opposed to something that's on a private Facebook group. So that's, that's just where I'm at with it. Thank you so much for joining me today, everyone. Thank you for caring about these cases like I do. I hope you have a wonderful weekend. And I'll see you back here on Monday. Uh, speaking of which, we've got a special guest on Johnny Vlogs on Monday, Danielle Hallen, coming back to the channel. We're going to talk a little bit more about the Noah Davis case, just kind of get our two brains together since we were kind of working in silos on our different halves and just see what conclusions we come to. So uh, you don't want to miss that. That'll be on Monday on Johnny Vlogs. Take care, everyone. I'll see you there. <laughs>